Welcome everyone. Thank you to everyone joining us from across the country and around the world. I'm Michael Higgs, Program Specialist here at Conscious Capitalism. On behalf of the entire CCI team, we appreciate you time taking time to learn and grow in community with us. Uh, today we're joined by Tara J. Frank to discuss her experiences as an equity specialist and author and how conscious business leaders can clear the way for workplace equity. In discussion with Tara will be Christina Johnson, uh, Executive Director of CCI's Washington, D.C. chapter. As many of you know, conscious capitalism is a philosophy that emphasizes the human nature of business as, as a movement of business leaders from around the world working to change the practice and perception of capitalism as a means to elevate humanity. Conscious Capitalism is a nonprofit organization dedicated to catalyzing that movement by creating learning opportunities like today's session and building systems of support for practicing conscious capitalists through our senior leader network membership. Several times a month, we're offering these virtual gatherings as a way for the community to see how this philosophy takes shape in the leadership journeys and business practices of those at our network. Today's gathering will run for about 45 minutes Christina and Tara will be in conversation for about 30, and then we'll transition to audience questions during the last 10 to 15, min 10 to 15 minutes of our session. Uh, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and uh, we'll get to as many of your questions as we can during our time together. If you have any technical questions, uh, please don't hesitate to email us at info at consciouscapitalism.org. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Today we're excited to be joined by Tara J. Frank, equity, strat uh, equity strategist and author of The Waymakers, Clearing a Path for Workplace Equity with Competence and Confidence. Throughout her career, Tara has advised and educated thousands of Fortune 500 executives across multiple industries and large member organizations. Her work, fueled by a deep belief in the creative power and potential of everyone, focuses on building bridges between people, ideas, and opportunity. We're also joined by our very own Christina Johnson, who will moderate today's conversation. We're really excited to have both of you with us today. Christina, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, well, I am so excited to be here today. Thank you everyone for joining and being a part of the session. Um, Tara, let's get started right away. Everyone, you all should know that we are um, closely connected and girlfriends, so this is like a pleasure to be with her, um, but I also am excited for her to share a little bit about herself and her book and to share with you all how um, she thinks you can make this journey as a way maker. So Tara, if you could tell us a little bit about you and what inspired you to write this book. Absolutely. First of all, thank you so much, Christina. It's wonderful uh, to see you again, even if via Zoom. And uh, thanks to Conscious Capitalism and the community for giving me this opportunity to just talk a little bit about what I'm up to. Uh, I'm really grateful. You know, it's I have an interesting background. People who work in workplace equity and diversity and inclusion come from all facets, I think, of business and life. And for me, I don't really have a background in you know, human resources. I don't have a background in organizational design. What I do have a background in is business, <laughs> which is one of the reasons why I'm so glad to have the opportunity to talk to all of you. I started my career at Hallmark Cards. I spent 21 years there. Uh, while I was there, I served as the vice president of creative writing and editorial. So I led product development um, for the entire organization on that side of the house for a while. I then ran business innovation for a few years, um, focusing on children as, a, as an innovation platform. I designed and stood up a multicultural center of excellence, which was really an embedment arm designed to help all of the consumer facing divisions better understand how America was changing and equip themselves to meet those new and emerging demands. Um, and then served as corporate culture advisor to the president and the CEO uh, before I resigned to kind of focus on building my own business, which is essentially consulting, working mostly with CEOs and C-suite teams to become the kind of companies they really want to be. So I know that was a, a long answer to your who are you, what is your background question. 
Um, but kind of shifting to why I wrote The Waymakers and to Michael's point, the, the title is The Waymakers Clearing the Path to Workplace Equity with Competence and Confidence. <laughs> and part of the answer to your question about why I wrote it is actually in the subtitle, right? I, I spent so much time with these C-suite teams talking to them about their workplace culture, about their diversity, equity, and inclusion challenges. And I noticed that most of them had three things in common. One was they wanted to do the right thing. Uh, two, didn't know exactly what the right thing was. And three, felt a little unsure about stepping into the work, right? Didn't want to make a mistake, to offend, to insult, to bring reputational risk upon themselves. And so I kind of recognized a gap, right? Where I needed to help leaders who have power in position to make good on their intentions. Uh, and that's really what The Waymakers is about. So thank you for giving that background. I think it's really illuminating. And I'm sure that our guests that are on the call today appreciate the context too, because um, I think it's just helpful to understand where people are coming from, uh, especially if, as subject matter experts. Um, so I think you know when you and I were talking, you were sharing a little bit about the book. And I think it's important to sort of bring this point home to our viewers today, because a lot of folks um, may not be sure of how to take the first step. And you've shared with me and I'm sure others who've heard a little bit about your book that this really is the first step. And talk to us a little bit about how this book is really for practitioners and it can really, um, it can be for people who are a little more experienced or people who are less experienced and anywhere along sort of the journey and, you know, for, for them and, and, and as they create their equitable workplace. Talk a little bit about that because sometimes it's scary to take that first step if you're yeah. not an expert in this space. I think so too. And you know, the interesting thing here, Christina, is this book is really for leaders. It's not for diversity professionals um, or not just for diversity professionals. It's for any leader who wants right, their particular macro or micro climate, you know, macro being the entire company, if that's the level at which you play, micro being your team or your division, who wants their environment to be a psychologically safe place, an open place, a creative place, an innovative place, a place where every single person on their team feels they belong and that they can contribute fully without fear of personal or reputational risk. In my opinion, that describes any successful leader of the future. And so the, the book, you know, which I've shared with people, it isn't just for folks who have a passion for DEI, whatever that means. It's for a leader who wants to lead sustainably. It's mm -hmm. for a leader who understands how the employee workforce is changing, has changed, will continue to change and who recognizes that without the skills and the strategies to unleash that potential to its fullest, they're not going to be successful as a leader, as a team, right? As a business, as somebody who's driving product. So that's kind of the really important part here. And the Waymakers is constructed, you know, I'll back up a little bit and kind of share with you what a Waymaker is, right? And there's, cause there's always a head part to this work and then there's a heart part to this work. I called it the Waymakers because when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we talk a lot about systems and strategies, and we should, right? It's important to address our talent systems, to understand where the bias is hiding, to root that out, and to do so in a way that is repeatable. But at the end of the day, aside from systems and strategies, every Black and Brown person I know who has made it to the top of their game has made it there because someone made a way for them. Someone opened a door and removed a barrier and ushered them through right to greater levels of contribution. And what I'm saying with this book is I am inviting all leaders to be the kind of leader who makes a way, but I'm not just inviting them. I'm also equipping them. Right, with the tools, with the strategies. I'm also inspiring them with the stories that show each and every person, no matter who you are, or where you come from, that you can lead in this way. Because honestly, what people need at the end of the day is the same. 
Everybody wants to feel seen, respected, valued, and protected. This is not a race thing. This is not a gender thing. This is not an ability thing. This is not a sexual orientation thing. This is a human thing. And what we don't recognize or deeply understand is that not everyone is getting those needs met to the same degree. And that's the problem that we as leaders need to solve. And that's who I wrote the book for. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does completely. And I'm glad that you sort of rounded that out because I think that, um, you know, today we're in such a polarizing space or a polarized space, I should say. And in the workplace, it's it's kind of scary, I think, for a lot of executives, um, especially because there are so many who have not sort of embraced the idea of DEI. And because we've had movements like, um, you know, that were triggered in, in 2020, in particular, like Black Lives, many people think DEI is only related to race. And I think that that's completely erroneous. And so actually, you kind of touched on that towards the end. Could you speak a little bit more about sort of the diversity of diversity and sort of the idea of equity and inclusion and how it's a little bit broader than I think um, many of us sort of track in our mind? Yeah, for sure. So I'm going to approach this, if you don't mind, through a very different frame than we normally talk about it. Okay, so come with me on a journey, everybody. Uh, One of the things that we did uh, for the book was we did a body of research with a company called Brand Trust. So Brand Trust is a um, brand strategy firm that uses behavioral and social sciences to solve complex business problems. So we did a narrative inquiry study, right? I'm going to take you on a journey. Just flow with me. We did a narrative inquiry study. We essentially asked hundreds of employees across all dimensions of difference to tell us stories of times they felt seen, respected, valued, and protected, and to tell us stories of times they felt invisible and disrespected and underappreciated and scrutinized. Wow. And what we learned in those stories is that once again, we have a lot more in common than not, okay? We also learned that again, some people, if they were onlys in their environments, if they were one of very few people like them in their environment, they actually had negative experiences more often than they did positive experiences. Yep. It was mostly because of that underrepresentation and the isolation that comes along with it. So when we talk about diversity, we're talking about whether there is equal or enough representation of lots of different kinds of people in your organization. That leads to a lot of good business stuff but it also combats that isolation. It also makes people feel safer to be who they are because they are not alone or they are not one person representing an entire group of people. So when I think about diversity, I think about how many perspectives, lived experiences, backgrounds, you know, frames, et cetera, do you have represented in your workforce so that nobody feels isolated and everyone can bring what is uniquely theirs to the table in service of better business decision-making and ideas. So for me, making people feel seen, visible in meetings, in decision-making rooms, in levels of leadership, et cetera, is directly tied to that diversity, which helps us with talent attraction. So that's how I think about diversity, right? And retention, yes. Right, well, getting there. So the respect piece, is really tied to this belonging. Sometimes you know this, Christina, and I'm sure everybody will be able to relate to this. We talk about inclusion sometimes and we kind of simplify it to belonging. And then we simplify belonging to be in welcoming. We say, well, we just wanna welcome everyone into our environment. We're a really welcoming place. We're nice to everyone. And what I tell- too simplistic. Yeah, what I tell high level leaders is people don't go to work to be welcomed. (laughs) <laughs> it's nice that you're nice to people. Let's just kind of back up and say, we should all do that. Sure. We're human beings. We should be nice. But I don't go to work to be welcomed. I go to work to fulfill my professional aspirations. I go to work to contribute. And so belonging is really about respect. Yep. 
Belonging is about respect. So that's what high level leaders need to understand. And respect looks like your personhood, but also your expertise and that's your right. experience and your ideas and your decisions, right? Yep. That's how I respect you. And that's what the research confirmed for us on the value piece it's pay, it's promotion, it's opportunity for advancement, but it's also just appreciation. And what we learned in the research is that the feeling valued is most closely linked to intent to stay. Yep. So there's your retention factor, yep. right? People are leaving because why? They feel overworked and undervalued. That's right. Because we keep saying people don't wanna work hard. That's not true. They are working hard. They just don't feel appropriately valued while they're working hard, you know? And so the, the last piece about protection is just about psychological safety, which you and I both know. Without that, you don't get any of the other stuff. It's like the precursor to everything good. And it's sure. also the outcome of everything good. And it's what really allows us to come up with or leave space for those big ideas that help drive our business forward. So my frame is a little different because I think about it from the person outward not yep. from the strategy inward. Does that make yep. sense? Absolutely. And I think, I mean, I'm, I think it's very simple, but it's, it's, um, it's not native for many of us to think of um, DEI and sort of optimizing our workplaces by way of people. Yes. Um, and so, yes, it certainly makes sense. And I hope that people are sort of taking notes and I hope that they're coming um, away with some really good tidbits that they can use and share online, maybe on Twitter and um, sharing some of your golden nuggets. While we're getting them excited about what they can learn in this book, what I'd love for you to do is share with us some of the um, framework. Tell us about the way that this book guides people. Tell us about the examples. What can they look forward to getting? Like, what are the tangible things they can take away from this book that will sort of catapult them into their journey um, as a way maker? Yeah, I love this. Um, I love this question because as I was writing it, here's what I was thinking. Like if a CEO called me on a Monday, right. And said, I've really not done anything yet. Right. Um, I don't know exactly what to do or where to start. What should I do? I wrote the book for that person, if that makes sense. And so sure. I have a disclaimer in there. That's basically like some of this might be more relevant to you than other parts, depending on where you are in your journey. But I start just by helping people understand why we are stuck. People ask me all the time, Christine, I'm sure they ask you as well, just generally speaking, why are we still talking about this after decades and we've really not made any meaningful progress or sustainable progress? It's frustrating, right? So I talk about why we're stuck. Um, one of the reasons, quite honestly, is just that we have too many fence sitters. And that's part of why I call the Waymakers an invitation. Anytime you go through any major change, and this kind of speaks to what you were saying about the divisiveness, you're always going to have some people on the front end of that change, like, let's go, let's get it. You're going to have other people, mm -hmm. you know, on the back end, crossing their arms, digging their heels in, right. you know, kind of like, <laughs> I like it this way, don't touch my stuff. And right. then in any change, the majority of people are, are in the middle. That's right. They're waiting, they're watching, they're trying to figure out what they think about what's happening. They Absolutely. may feel badly about what they see, but don't necessarily see themselves as playing an active role in facilitating it. And so we're stuck because that group of fence sitters is still too big. They still don't see themselves as having an active role and they don't know how to play the role. So the sure. Waymakers was written for that person. It starts with why we're stuck. It goes through some of the big obstacles in our workplaces that we may not have a lens for. And so I break that all the way down. Things like what lack of representation really means and how it manifests, what the lack of psychological safety actually costs us as an example. It goes through how to conduct a climate assessment because people always say, what's the silver bullet tar? What should I go do? I'm like, it depends. Right. It depends, <laughs> right. right, on your current state, on where you are today, where you on are. what people are experiencing. Right. So I break down how to conduct a climate assessment. I talk about the four talent needs and what it actually looks like for leaders to make choices and behaviors that make people feel seen, respected, valued, and protected. Mm -hmm. I connect those things to, to talent outcomes, to business outcomes yep. really clearly um, with my own research, but also a lot of secondary research. 
And then, you know, I get to the heart place too, right? I talk about what are the choices that, that way makers make? What are the behaviors they exhibit? What are the commitments, right? And, and how do we kind of take all of this insight and information and inspiration and move forward to actually make a way uh, for other people? So, you know, I break it all the way down because I wanted it to be not only a good read, but a useful one. Right, right. Utility is critical. And, and when people have such limited time and so many pressures and demands upon their time, it is critical that they take something valuable and sort of turn key away from a, a book investment. So let me ask you this question, because I think that we're going to have people on this call who may be coming into this with the purest of intentions. This is sort of their leadership calling, and this is the direction that they want to go in. Um, to be a, a way maker, that is. There will be some people who are kind of forced into this. I mean, they're interested in learning more, but the reality is that their corporate culture is calling for it or their community is calling for it. And, and one of the things they're going to have to do either way, however people come to this book and to this experience and journey, they got to report out on sort of how they're doing. Talk a little bit for me, please, about sort of um, the book's, you know, instruction on how people report. How do they track? How do they um, sort of identify KPIs or what the change should look like? And if it's made, how is it successful? How can people kind of dig into that in the book? Yeah, this is such a good question. So there's a whole section in there about accountability, um, how to drive accountability, how to monitor accountability, you know, for ourselves and for the people on our teams and the people around us. And here's what I will say, anything that, anything you set a goal for can be measured. We all know this, right? It's just a matter of how you measure it. Some of this work is more easily measured by signs of progress, right? Things like participation, things like movement, right? Are, are people of different employee segments moving around more often because people of color at work, for instance, tend to get stuck in the same job or at the same band for 10, 15, 20 years. So there are signs of progress that you can key into, like the participation, like the movement, um, like the you know, promotion rates, relative right. promotion rates. There are also harder things to, to track. You know, when people say they want to increase their representation, folks are like, what benchmark should I use? That's the biggest question I get. I don't know what benchmark to use. I'm like, honestly, it doesn't matter as long as you yeah. pick one <laughs> and, and then put <laughs> strategies in place to reach it and monitor it and hold right. yourself ac yourselves accountable. The reason I say it doesn't matter is because there is no one right way to do that. Some of my clients set uh, representation targets based on um, the, you know, the American demography because they have yeah. consumer brands. Others set targets based on their growth, you know, their consumer growth rates. So for instance, I have a client who their growth is being driven by black women specifically. Mm -hmm. So I said to them, well, you should probably have a lot better representation of black women inside your company because those perspectives and lived experiences are driving your business growth. Mm -hmm. Others are so far behind, if you will, that I say, look, if you set a target to triple your growth, which may not be easy, you know, you're gonna get further than you are today. Yeah. So yeah. I break all of that down, honestly, from a representation, right. retention, cl clearly we can track, you know, turnover, involuntary turnover across segments, across levels. Um, so there are a lot of ways to do that, but I get pretty tactical, honestly, about it because I know how often I get asked how should we do this and how should we do it well? And I want that. I want people to have those answers. Thank you for sharing that. I think, um, you know, as you were talking, there was something that occurred to me and this is, um, this is telling the story. So I was just thinking about how people tell the story of their successes and what the outcomes are of the effort that they've invested in uh, being a way maker and making ways for others. Tell me, maybe one or two stories, maybe pick a small company and a large company and talk about the change and the positive change that occurred as a result of them going down this path. Because I want our viewers and participants today in this segment to walk away with something they can relate to 
that is inspiring for them and that will sort of guide them into becoming a waymaker themselves. Yeah, this is this is great. So there are two, I'll share two examples to your point. So um, I work mostly with pretty large multinational companies. So a lot of complexity. Um, there's one uh, l- largest consumer products brand in the world. Um, I probably don't have to name them and I won't. But uh, one of their divisions, which is you know multiple b- billions of dollars just for division, we worked with their entire executive team um, to better understand, two, a couple of years ago, we started our journey together, to better understand the lived experiences of the multicultural women in their organization. We did that by bringing them together across difference, right, in immersive experiences, letting those stories be told, sharing research and data to underscore that, um, kind of laying out the cost of bias, how it impacts business, but also how it impacts teams, took them through an innovation experience where they could kind of look at their talent processes through multiple lenses and then come up with potential solutions to that in collaboration with their multicultural women. We started that journey a couple of years ago. They're still on that journey today. What it has done is given them a common language for what it looks like to make a way for their multicultural women. It has uh, brought them together to determine and commit to a series of actions. Coming out of that very first session we had, they actually declared the percentage of their entire workforce that would be multicultural women in the next few years. They, they set that goal coming out of that session we had and they've been monitoring it ever since. So they've been able to increase representation and leadership but you know what? The best companies, uh, and this is an example, aren't satisfied with just a little bit of progress here or a little bit of progress there or checking a box there. This is a journey they're continuing. They're now wanting to teach all of their managers who have multicultural women who report to them how to make a way. We're bringing them into sessions, sharing with them the choices and behaviors they need to make getting them up to speed and on board, and then creating trust centers between them and their people so that they can start that relationship on a good foot. Like this is the kind of work that makes a difference because it's people-centric work. It's not just your strategies and your targets, which are great and important, but it's also calling people in to the center of the work, which is really about how we see each other, again, respect each other, and enable opportunity for everybody. So that's a big, huge company. There are other companies where I met with their entire executive team and their board of directors to help them understand what great looks like from a DEI standpoint, um, what kinds of things they can reasonably aspire to. They took that and ran with it. They've gotten awards in the last couple of years for some of their DE&I progress and work that they've done. And their culture is supremely healthy. It's now one of those companies that I've had other people say to me, Tara, uh, if you ask me three companies I want to go work for, this is one of them. Right. So it's a matter of how seriously the leaders take it, how much they take it to heart, right? What they're willing to invest time-wise and and certainly, you know, money-wise and how patient they're willing to be with the journey because it is a journey. It's not a box checking exercise. Mm -hmm. And I and I, I'm gonna. Um, we've got a minute left. I want us to use to use that minute because I'm thinking we might have small business owners or executives of smaller companies on the phone, and they're just getting started. Maybe they've got a diverse workforce. Maybe they really embrace way making, yeah. um, and they might want to relate. Is there one example or story that you can share? from a smaller business that perhaps you've worked with and you felt like their CEO or their leader just sort of took off and really embraced the idea of way making and did it well. Yeah, what I would say, honestly, Christina, I don't work with a lot of small companies, um, but it is, a, it is an individual journey too. So what I would say to any one leader of a small business um, is read the book, right? Think about it, do the, do the exercises, reflect on it. If you begin to model way making, if you begin to ask those who work alongside you to model way making, if you start to hold people accountable for the ways they make a way or not, 
no matter how small your outfit is, <laughs> you're going to create the kind of environment where great things happen from a business standpoint and where people really want to come work alongside you. Here's the best example, Christina. Honestly, I run a small business. So yeah. my clients aren't small businesses, but I run a small business. Right, right. I can't tell you how many times a week people reach out to me on LinkedIn asking me if they can come work for me. Some of them work at huge companies right now. And they're right, like, right. are you hiring? <laughs> It's because what they right, what they're feeling and what they're seeing is that way making spirit. And it inspires people, I, I think, to lead differently. Well, I appreciate that. I think that you've been inspirational and I hope that people are walking away with an attitude of way making. Um, you know, because I think so much of being of service to others actually is self-serving as well, sort of in, in you know, the most humble, um, sort of an altruistic way. When you serve others, you serve yourself, you serve your business, you serve your clients when you're serving your teams. Um, there is, I think I'm gonna end up passing the baton to, to Michael again. There is a question that's open. You actually just touched on something. Michael, do you mind if I wrote Tara into that question that came by way of the Q&A? She was just talking about this. Absolutely. Please do, Christina. Thank you. So, yeah. So we've got a guest, an anonymous attendee, um, Tar, and she says that her understanding from the disability community is many DEI programs leave accessibility out. And yet there's a lot of in intersectionality between DEI and the, late, the last letter A for A11Y, and as an ally, of course. Um, what did you learn from your research on this seemingly missing piece, and what can we do to create the um, psychological safety and inclusive belonging culture that helps all people with disabilities, including sort of the hidden disabilities like dyslexia and depression that are often underreported due to stigma, um, feel safe in reaching out uh, for the help that they need in the workplace. And this is great. You and I have, act I think we talked about this before at the CEO summit a little bit um, about the unseen disabilities and struggles that people have in the workplace and how we kind of sometimes miss out on the idea of diversity when we're thinking about um, the opportunity to serve all different types of people. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. He, here's the bottom line. And I want to share a little bit about my philosophy because I think it really matters here. Um, I will first admit that the depth of my work, meaning, you know, if I go back 10, 20 years of my experience, has mostly focused on black and brown people. To your point, there are all kinds of intersectionalities. My work now though, the way making work is human centric work. And the frames that I share, right, are frames that one person can use with any other person or multiple people because I don't teach about race in the book. I don't teach about gender in the book. I don't teach about disability in the book. What I teach is leaders to better get to know, understand, and meet the needs of every single person in their charge. And the ways we do that have more to do with humility and curiosity and connectedness and listening and collaboration, right? And bringing everybody in to be part of that collaborative visioning then it has to do with specific dimensions of difference, if, if that makes sense. That's the difference yes. in the way making that people ask me all the time. Can you give us a presentation on how black people are different from Asian people are different from Hispanic people? And then can you give us a, and I'm like, I don't do that. That's not the work I do. Right, the work right. I do helps every single leader be a better leader for every single person. Great. Thank you for answering that. And I'm going to pass the baton over to Michael because I think he is going to walk you through the remaining questions. But thank you for your time and for allowing me to ask you questions, to explore your great new book. Thank so, you so much for being here with me and just, yeah, ask great questions. I appreciate the opportunity again. Of course. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, uh, Tara, for, for sharing uh, the wonderful work that you're doing in the world with our community. And Christina, fabulous job moderating that conversation. Thank you for surfacing all of those insights um, that Tara so gracious, graciously shared. Um, we have a question from, from Sadie. Um, and Sadie asked, uh, what are the ways to continue, what are some ways to continue to hold companies uh, accountable 
uh, for this work, aside from having you, Tara, come in and host a workshop or a session, you know, how do we actually ensure that that change can, continues to happen uh, long term? And thank you. Uh, it's actually Shay Day. Uh, I, I do apologize. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's a great question. And it kind of, um, I'd say the answer depends, meaning are you inside the company trying to hold them accountable? Is, is it a peer you're trying to hold accountable? Like, of course, there are different strategies and tactics. What I would say, generally speaking, is that we have to teach ourselves, we all have to teach ourselves to ask better questions. <laughs> when we ask better questions, right, um, we're able to get the kinds of answers that we can I'll say anchor ourselves with and then hold people accountable to. So here's an example. If your company says, we're trying to get better at D, E, and I, a good question is, what, is that, what does that mean for us? When we say we're trying to get better at D, E, and I, how should that manifest? What will be true if we get better at it? How will we be different two or three years from now? What do we believe we'll have to embrace as a leadership team or as an organization? What new behaviors might we have to exhibit? What new choices might we have to make in order to achieve the aspiration or vision that you have in your mind? How frequently are we planning to monitor that? What will we do if we're not getting there? How will we celebrate if we are? To me, honestly, the power of the question is the very best way to hold ourselves and others accountable. Um, and and I, I can only share that in the absence of specifics, right? Which is just to say, ask as many questions as we can and ask how we're going to hold ourselves accountable. But people always say, how are we gonna hold them accountable? This is an us thing. And if we keep talking about it as us and them, it's harder, I think, for us as individuals to recognize the role we can abs you know, actually play in that kind of progress. If people feel like we're in this together, you know, it tends to land a little bit differently. But yeah, the power of the question, we got to ask better questions. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shade's um, question was a good one. That was a good one. Thank you, Shade. Aaron. Uh, it, it just a quick announcement from Greg. He just pre-ordered the book. Oh, thank you so, so much. Yeah. Uh, he is very uh, excited to learn and, and read more. Um, and just in, uh, for anyone who is joining us today, if you do have a question for, for Tara, uh, please uh, put it into the Q&A. So we uh, have about seven or so minutes remaining. Uh, Tara, a question occurred to me, um, you know, as you endeavor to do this work in the world and you sort of, uh, there are more people embracing this way maker philosophy. Um, if we fast forward, say three to five years, describe the workplace that, that you might envision um, as, your, as your work takes hold in the world. Yeah, I, I love this question, by the way. Um, I was actually with a, a client a couple weeks ago and we were on stage and she hadn't primed me for this, but she said, okay, if we get inclusion right, how will we know? And if we're still doing it wrong, how will we know? And so I'm going to answer it through that lens, if that's OK, Michael, because I felt like it was really uh, helpful. I said, if you're getting inclusion right, this is how you'll know. People on your team will push back on you occasionally. They'll disagree with you now and then. They'll bring up ideas that may sound crazy, but that you'd never thought about. They will start telling their friends what a great company you are and they will invite them to also apply to come work for you. They will be having fun while they're working. You will hear them if you're in the same space laughing and enjoying the work that they're doing. They will give you more discretionary effort, meaning they don't have to be working at 9.30 at night, but you might catch them working 9.30 at night because they're excited about that thing they're doing and they wanna keep doing it. When you walk into rooms, Zoom rooms or otherwise, you will see lots of different faces, different kinds of people with different experiences in those spaces, talking and sharing ideas and building together. Your top level of leadership will be more visibly diverse than it is today. These are the ways that we will know in two or three years if we're making progress. If you're not making progress, people will be perfectionists. 
they will ask you for not only the principles by which they should work, but the rules. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They will not color outside of the lines. They will keep asking you how, but how, but how, even as you're telling them, go lead, go figure it out, right? Your rooms will still be homogenous. Your teams will still be homogenous. People will look like they are desperate to clock out at 5 p.m. They will sometimes be late with things or incomplete with things according to you, or things will have less sizzle, less passion, less interest, less newness because you can't possibly be creative and innovative if you do not feel psychologically safe. So that would be my answer. That's some of what we would see if we're doing it right and some of what we would see if we're doing it wrong. And some of you see this today, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. So there's work to do. Um, just, you touched on so many of the things that uh, one of our guests uh, asked in his question. Uh, John, John was asking, you know, what do you do if senior leaders aren't fully committed? Um, and what can leaders in an organization do who aren't senior leaders to do to move things forward? And, and I, I just want to give you an opportunity to add any addition. I feel like you've given us basically the playbook. <laughs> <laughs> but if there's anything you want to add to uh, for additional context for John, please do so. Um, this is and, honestly a perfect way to end this time together because I'm going to give you the number one thing that we can do. We have to remember again that in any change, 20% are going to be leading the way, 20% are going to be digging their heels in, 60% are going to be sitting there watching and waiting. If even half of that 60% decided that they are no longer going to watch and wait, but get into the equity arena, you will tip the scales. That's why I tell everybody, this is not about what they can do. It's about what you can do in concert, in collaboration with other people who believe as you do, that every single person deserves an opportunity to thrive and perform at their fullest potential. Get together. If even half of those people decided I'm no longer going to sit on the fence, you would change your company. You have that opportunity. I hope you accept that invitation uh, and I wish you the best on that journey forward. Wow, what a remarkable close. And to all our attendees, uh, challenge. Um, challenge accepted, Tara, thank you for that. And uh, thank you for everyone for joining us today. Um, if you do have uh, 30 seconds or so, uh, please do fill out the survey that uh, Kim has so graciously put in the chat. Um, it does help us with future programming. Um, and if you are new to Conscious Capitalism, please visit our website, consciouscapitalism.org for more information about our movement and our organization. Um, and if you're an executive currently implementing conscious practices in your business, uh, we invite you to uh, join our, our growing support system for like-minded leaders uh, by way of our senior leader network. And again, you can find some more information, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on our website about that. Uh, just a quick announcement for next week's programming, um, or actually, excuse me, two weeks from now, uh, invitation for everyone to join us on April 28th uh, with Keisha Williams from the Human Rights Campaign to discuss corporate uh, equity in the corporate equity index um, and the importance of having the business community involved in the expansion of rights for the LGBTQ plus community. Um, you can find more information about that. I think Kim added a link to that event in the chat as well. And again, uh, thank you to everyone for joining us, Tara. Thank you for being so gracious, uh, sharing your wisdom. Um, and your time with our community. And Christina, thank you for that fantastic moderation of the conversation. Thank you both so much. And to everybody who joined us, I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you all have, have a great day. day. You too. Bye.